Nikki wants to talk to you a little bit before we start. Okay, so just before we, we start, I want to remind everybody that in a little bit more than a month from now we have the annual retreat in Gedi. And we send a message uh, inviting everybody that wants to present their work. Um, so welcome to do that. So please send the uh, titles uh, and something that you want to, to root in, that you want to present. Also, if you intend to present the post, it would be good to know about it in advance. I will send you a reminder on Sunday, but I would like to encourage everybody to be very proud of the work. How much does it cost to stay there? That's, uh, I'm the... 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 i if one of you wants to be the DJ of the party, do you second me or if you have suggestions for it? The party is for us, so you should know more or less what you want. Okay? And today I'm very pleased to introduce Mona. It's a great honor to have her here. And uh, I'm usually very happy to have women present in seminars. <laughs> so Mona, she, she did a bachelor in the Hebrew University and then her uh, PhD in the Weizmann Institute and the postdoc in Rockefeller in New York. And she has an amazing uh, line of research that I'll let her expose to you in, in her seminar. Thank you very much, Mona. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. We need a microphone, Mona. Is that the <laughs> problem? It's on. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine without. It is on. Years ago, the university sent me to lecture in Mexico City and there were like 3,000 people in the audience with slanted eyes. And when I'm nervous, I always speak even, even quieter than usual. And someone in the back of that huge hall shouted, Lo show me! <laughs> <laughs> she was from Beersheba. <laughs> so the title uh, I chose for this uh, lecture. Lo show me! Lo show me! <laughs> I'll hold it like that. Is that better? <laughs> it's on. I don't know. I don't know if I have a volume control. You should uh, play it. Uh, must be a volume. There is no volume. There is no volume. This is the best we can do. I'll try to speak. As, as you have to be quiet. Yeah. So the title says the promise and challenges of neuronal microRNA and what I mean by challenge is a double challenge. The challenge in the field and the challenge to present <coughs> such a topic to my friends at the Brain Center, which is not a, a small matter either. So what are microRNAs? You see here a molecular model of a microRNA that is in atomic resolution and it's spinning. And let's say that microRNA taught us that everything we studied when we were students is wrong. So we studied a theory that a gene is made of DNA and that makes RNA and that makes protein. And here is a new family of genes that do not do that. They do not make any proteins. They actually block other genes from making their proteins. So one might say it's better to put a policeman in the section than run many different cars. Or it's better to put a dimmer to dim down the lights in the entire room. But this concept is new to biological research, and that's uh, part of it, it being so special. Now, this, this was part of the uh, art exhibition that Elsa uh, participated in, but most of the beautiful photographs that you'll see today are not mine, but my son's, who uh, is a special L teacher. And what I came to talk to you about today is the project we submitted to the ERC, and the logo of which 
shows is shown here, and this is about microRNAs that block acetylcholine signaling, which we call cholinomials. Not only how they work, but what do mutations that interfere with their function do to the carriers of these mutations, and what does it mean to the functioning of nerve cells. And because the topic is so different from what you're usually uh, hearing here, please stop me if I use jargon that is not familiar. I once said that in a seminar and someone said, what is jargon? <laughs> <laughs> so, a scientist is someone who knows more and more about less and less, and we are talking about DNA that composes genes, that make RNA, and <coughs> that happens in the nucleus, then the RNA goes out and can be translated into protein if these are protein coding genes. But many of the RNAs that we know about today do not do that. So they are called non-coding RNA. Part of them exist in regions of the genome that we used to call junk DNA, just because we didn't understand. And this is a typical structure of one of those microRNAs that I'll talk about. And as usual, what we want to do is simplify what we see. And I always like to quote Leonardo saying that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, except that we usually fail in doing that. So microRNAs. The Nobel site says that microRNAs create helpings that block other genes from making proteins. The people who discovered them less than 20 years ago already won a Nobel Prize for that discovery because in, a, in essence it shifted biology from a one-on-one -on -one topic to a combinatorial thing. And that's one of the most interesting aspects of it. <coughs> Most of the RNA, microRNA <coughs> research is focused in cancer. And most of the publications are on cancer, and, and the importance of the field is at least partially become clinically believed to make a real change in biomedical research. But what we focus about is what happens to microRNAs that are expressed in the brain, how they affect human brain functioning, how do they convey messages to the body, which is not less important. So here is uh, the theory, the concept. The concept says, and like every paper you read about microRNAs, will start with this sentence. Every microRNA has many different targets. Every target gene has many microRNAs that may affect it. And then the paper shifts to focus on one microRNA and one target, simply because it's too difficult or too complicated to study more than that. What we suggested is to start approaching the challenge of this complexity, thinking that some of the targets by themselves may be regulatory. <coughs> so uh, let's think about a cholinergic synapse as a reservoir that needs to be filled with a certain level of acetylcholine, and think about how microRNAs may control this reservoir. So suppose we think about microRNAs that target cholinergic genes. Which genes would those be? So last year there was this Board of Governors dinner, and I was uh, sitting in a table with a French clinician. And the guy says, takes his Blackberry and says, how do you spell your name? And Googles me at the dinner table and says, oh, acetylcholinesterase. So if you wondered how I spell my name, We've been studying this protein for many years. Acetylcholinesterase is the bottleneck controller of the levels of acetylcholine in cholinergic synapses. MicroRNAs that control it would definitely also control other targets. And all of that would affect the levels of acetylcholine, which we know is responsible for many functions. What we focus on right now is anxiety and at the same uh, level, inflammation, which builds 
anxiety, and in Baal Shog in her PhD, for example. And all of that says that even in this one simple aspect, it's a narrow window into the field, we already see quite a complex formula. Now, add to that the fact that about one third of the newly discovered microRNAs are primate specific. <coughs> there is no mouse model. So you have a question that also relates to the evolutionary aspect. What did microRNAs do to make us different from other mammals? And this is an issue that is discussed uh, a lot in the literature and we started to touch upon it. So why did I say that acetylcholine blocks inflammation? You can find a lot of articles uh, dealing with that. And principally, acetylcholine interacts with an acetylcholine receptor on the plasma membrane of macrophages, the immune cells. This is an alpha-7 nicotinic receptor, and it blocks the production of pro-inflammatory <coughs> proteins, which can find their way into the brain and amplify neuronal activities. So you might say that this neurotransmitter controls functioning in the heart, in the liver, in the intestine, and complex circuits from the body to the brain. Okay. Now, which aspect would we focus on? I'm, I'm showing you here a summary that was prepared by Robert Sapolsky from Stanford on a paper that was published by Daniela Kaufer, who was then a PhD student in the lab. And what she showed was in the hippocampus, and she showed that at the acute phase of stress, seconds to minutes from a stressful insult, would activate the induction of transcription regulators, such as CFOS, elevate acetylcholinesterase, and reduce the producing genes, the vesicular acetylcholine transporter, the choline acetyltransferase. <coughs> so you get a change in acetylcholine balance within minutes. And I was really troubled by that already then. How come transcription is changed within <coughs> minutes? Transcription takes many tens of minutes. Then translation takes many tens of minutes. How can we think that we did see a change? in a protein level within 20 minutes. And that was in the back of my mind for a while, and when microRNAs were discovered, I said, aha, if you block production, that is a much more rapid step than inducing production. To block something from being made based on existing RNA can close some of the gaps between the speed of neuronal function and the very slow phase of gene expression. So what I would like to cover today is how microRNA controllers of cholinergic regions and dysregulating mutations thereof affect anxiety and inflammation. We would like to talk about <coughs> those that can be studied in mice, so in engineered mouse models, and also about those that cannot be tested in mice because they only exist in human beings, so they must be studied in humans. Okay, so this again is our very first microRNA to be discovered, microRNA 132, they're all numbered, and most of those with four <coughs> digits or above 500 <coughs> are, are a primate specific and newer than the old number, so 132 is a well-established microRNA. It has its own gene, its own promoter. It reacts to changes in calcium concentration, and it's conserved in many species, including mice. So. That, uh, we found it by complementarity of the sequence. And this is the basic principle. <coughs> microRNAs recognize their targets because they have a complementary sequence, so they co form something which would be double-stranded in, in part of the region, only seven nucleotides, but it's a double strand. But you need to prove that they do what they do. And you need to prove that at the level of the molecule, at the level of the cell, if possible, by engineering the mouse, 
is not possible in human brain tissue. And finally, last but not least, look at the phenotype, both in a mouse and in humans. So what did we do to make that happen? So David Greenberg in the lab engineered the acetylcholinesterase gene of humans to change the potential binding sites that should recognize microRNA-132. And we put it in cells that produce microRNA-132, CHO6. When you uh, transfect these cells with acetylcholinesterase, you get a certain level of activity. If you transfect them with the cDNA where mutation interferes with binding of this microRNA, we double the level. This is typical of what microRNAs do. They do not cause a thousandfold difference, but a double is typical. So this is a gain of function. What about loss of function? We can put a microRNA in a virus and infect it, and that reduces the level, again, by twofold. So we have a gain of function and a loss of function proof that this sequence complementarity is for real. Now, how do we know that it does what it does? Because it targets our gene, because of the interaction with acetylcholinesterase. <coughs> so uh, this is a study that we, in which what we did was to stress mice by a food shock, put them in elevated plasmase, which shows that when you stress a mouse, it becomes anxious, not surprisingly, in a more rich water maze, which shows that when you stress a mouse, it develops learning and memory difficulties. But we did that also after injecting into the brain a control a virus that would not change anything or a virus that would suppress acetylcholinesterase. What you see here, we always put the mice over here in a moist water maze, and a normal mouse would be really troubled after food shock and they would fail to find a platform. They fail the learning test. If we suppress the acetylcholinesterase, they find it. And at the same time, we show that the, the microRNA is shooting up very rapidly, quite a lot, especially in the prefrontal cortex and in the hippocampus. Okay. So now, how do we engineer a mouse? Again, what we have done was to take off the entire region that reacts to microRNA and create a mouse that has an excess of esterase without being able to be controlled by the microRNA. And this is how that mouse behaves. These mice run. This is normal speed. So any one of you who saw mice, they sit down, they scratch, they look for food. These mice run. They run all the time. They are 15% lighter in weight than the little mates. So this is very good, you'd say, but not really because they fail in the serial maze. So a normal mouse we put in a maze finds the way very rapidly to get to the other side. And the engineered mouse, I hope you can see it, they go back and forth and they make tra retracing errors and they forgot their glasses and they don't know where they left the keys. I should be careful with that because once a woman shouted, just like me. <laughs> so you'll say again, we know that when we are stressed, we make a, a decision error. Do they but get shorter lives? Or? I don't know. I could never afford it. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> if university charges so much and we have such a few number of cages that we could never let them die and then leave <laughs> on their own. So we have a cognition issue, we have an anxiety issue, and they show massive inflammation. And that, of course, raises the question, is this relevant to human beings as well? And Shani Shenhar, a postdoc in the lab, looked at this microRNA in intestinal uh, uh, samples that were dissected from patients with intestinal bowel disease. So they, what the surgeons do is they remove a piece and they remove the entire inflamed piece until they reach a quiet piece. <laughs> so we compared the inflamed and non-inflamed and this microRNA is shooting up like crazy 
in the inflamed uh, human tissue. And of course, the next question is what happens in Alzheimer's disease. So what Shachar could show by a bioinformatic analysis a couple of years ago is that most microRNAs are malfunctioning in the Alzheimer's brain. Most of them are reduced. But this one is reduced much more than others. So microRNA-132 is one of the most badly damaged microRNAs <coughs> in the Alzheimer's brain. And that again gave me a new perspective <coughs> about Alzheimer's medications. Because the only medications today that are available to Alzheimer's patients are anticholinesterase inhibitors, one of which was invented at the Hebrew University. And one asks, how come you need such a treatment when the neurons that die first in the Alzheimer's brain are those that produce acetylcholinesterase? And that again is known for 30 years. You need that because those neurons that survive lost the microRNA regulation. So they make an excess of the protein, thereby the inhibition is a required issue. So what about other targets? This is a very popular microRNA 132. It targets not only acetylcholinesterase, which of course is the most important one, but a lot of other nervous system genes, a lot of inflammatory regulators, a lot of epigenetic controllers, some cell proliferation processes, which of course are very popular with cancer researchers, <coughs> and metabolism regulators. So how special is this? Apparently there are many microRNAs that share functions between the immune system and the brain. And when I started this project, I went deliberately to prove how the brain controls the immune system. And we found that it's not always the case. It's a bi bidirectional dialogue. The immune <coughs> system talks to the brain and <coughs> vice versa. Now each of these papers, which will of course appear in the website, talks about one target. Most of them neglect all the other targets. And each of them is sure that this is the most important function of the microRNA saying that this is again one of the main challenges that I would like to put to you guys. We need analytic power to study the interactions between these microRNAs and their targets, and I don't think we even have the, the correct models as yet. And uh, we are proceeding in the lab now with excess <coughs> microRNA expression in another engineered mouse, but that we wait for so what about the interaction between microRNAs and our genome? Years ago, I had the illusion that cholinesterases would be easy to clone. This was before the Human Genome Project, and it took me like seven years. But we cloned the two human genes that encode for cholinesterases. So we found that there were mutation carriers in the coding regions of cholinesterases where the protein is not functioning well and they are very sensitive, for example, to insecticides or, God forbid, to nerve cases, they would be very sensitive <coughs> to any blocker of cholinesterase. Years after, we ran a study together with Alon Friedman from Ben Gurion University on carriers of such mutations that live next to uh, agricultural insecticide spread areas, <coughs> not occupationally exposed, environmentally exposed. And they showed hyperactivity by EEG analysis in the frontal lobe, down regulation in deep nuclei. This is paraoxone, which is what they were exposed to. It's a metabolite of parathion, and it's sprayed on cotton fields, on orchards. And those carriers also showed learning and memory difficulties. So we need to have the correct level of acetylcholinesterase in the brain. And when we did that study, we also found other mutations that occurred in non-coding regions. But we couldn't understand what they meant, because this was a region that didn't change the protein. So we sort of ignored that. And now we said, OK, could those mutations interfere with interaction of microRNA regulators, 
which primarily interact with the non-coding region of uh, microRNA, of the uh, gene, the protein genes. So that, of course, reminds me of one of my great heroes, Eric Kandel, who said that the future of psychiatric research would be when we combine a neuronal circuit analysis with genome studies. So, oh, how is BCG? BCG, oh, sorry. There are two human genes that encode for cholinesterases. When we went for cloning, we wanted to get to a certain cholinesterase, and of course, in Murphy's Law, we first cloned the other gene, so we ended up cloning both of them. Acetylcholinesterase is highly selective. It only recognizes acetylcholine. Butyrylcholinesterase recognizes a lot of analogs, a lot of other compounds that don't really exist in nature. It's much less selective. Acetylcholinesterase is the major one in the brain. Butyrylcholinesterase in the periphery. Okay? And mutations in both of them would cause severe problems when you are exposed to <coughs> inhibitors of cholinesterase. And this nature medicine study was because a faculty member in another institute had, a, still had, a son who was exposed to the army's medication in, uh, under alert for exposure to nerve gas. And that guy <coughs> carried a mutation in the butyryl cholinesterase gene. And he developed insomnia and deep depression and weight loss because of the use of that medication. So mutations in these genes are important, and now we are starting to recognize that some of these mutations affect the non-coding region. So Geula Hanin in the lab ran a theoretical study what she asked is how many microRNAs could interact with acetylcholinesterase. There are two major variants. One is in the brain, and the other one is in the periphery. And the one in the periphery targets most of the microRNAs compared to the one in the brain, which is not very popular. The other targets of those microRNAs treat neuronal functions or immune functions or both. So that was strengthening our hypothesis. But then, after we published that article, we found another microRNA which just emerged in the literature, a later one, which is a primate-specific one. So it's evolutionarily young. Now, I said that in a, another country, and someone said, what do you mean evolutionarily young? Evolution is long ago. Not true. Evolution is here and now. And the proof for that is sickle cell anemia, which is an evolutionary disease that had very high incidence in black tribes in Africa because it conferred selection advantage against the set supply. When the African tribes moved to the United States, in 300 years, the incidence of that mutation went down drastically because it's not evolutionarily advantageous any longer. So we found this new microRNA, which interacts theoretically with both variants of the cholinesterase, <coughs> which is primate specific, and which, in which we found a nu mutation, a single nucleotide polymorphism in the acetylcholinesterase gene, exactly where it should bind. So the so question, I'm, yeah. I'm so okay. So are you talking about? Effect of the microRNA on the on those uh, <coughs> genes or, or vice versa. Uh, very excellent question. I'll get to that in a minute. You're right. There is a bidirectional communication but here, here too. Right now, we still started by asking which microRNA can target these genes. Okay, and then we found <coughs> one where a mutation in the human genome might interfere with that interaction. But again, we need to prove that, okay? So, the first question we had is, is this a real microRNA? MicroRNAs in the literature are 20 to 22 nucleotides long, about 100-fold smaller than a regular gene. This one was 25. MicroRNAs appeared in a lot of data sets. This one is new. It didn't yet appear in any data set. So what Geula did was to uh, amplify it and sequence it. 
from the human intestinal sample GF and from human brain tissues. So it is a genuine sequence. It's expressed in human tissues. Now, microRNAs also precipitate with a protein that makes the interaction between a microRNA and its target. The protein is called argonaut or ago, and Geula precipitated ago and found that the microRNA goes down with it. So this is a real microRNA. It's a functioning microRNA. Now the question is, would it suppress acetylcholinesterase? There is a gold standard test. What you do is you take the region that includes binding sites and you try to see if you infect cells with a virus that encodes this microRNA, would you suppress the expression? And it did same uh, efficiency as 132. Then we have another advantage in that we know the protein target. We can measure the activity of the protein. So we took a human cell line, and when you infect those cells, you get suppression, again with both microRNAs. So that says this is a <coughs> microRNA, bona fide, and it works with acetylcholinesterase. Now, the next question is, where does it come from? I was telling you before that microRNA-132 has its own gene, its own promoter. This one is not that case. It piggybacks on another gene. This microRNA sort of sneaked into an intron, a non-coding region of another gene. That gene is called semaphorin A4G, and its promoter, which would activate the microRNA, talks about activation in anxiety and in inflammation. So that fits the general picture. Then we ran another bioinformatics test and we asked which targets of this new microRNA would be relevant for anxiety and inflammation. And surprise, surprise, we found acetylcholinesterase, but we did find another protein, CDC42. So, what does that protein do? It is involved in immune function. It is involved in moving immune reactions from the innate immunity to the adaptive immunity, from the natural automatic process to the production of antibodies. And it's involved in brain functioning. It's expressed in cerebellum and the hippocampus and the amygdala. And what it does there is it brings GABAergic receptors to the synapse. Now, you could tell me that GABAergic synapses are anxiolytic. That's true. So we have here something that is involved both with, in, with anxiety and with immune function. And the question is, the question now comes to Heim's question. Is microRNA functioning dependent only on the microRNA level? What about the mRNA? And actually there is a theory in the field Ran, uh, run by Pandolfi from Harvard that says we can't really consider that microRNAs would block without taking preference of the number of mRNA molecules. So the number of <coughs> copies that can become targets is also functioning. So that brings us to another quotation that I like of Humberto Eco from the Foucault Pendulum and he says for every complex problem, there is a simple answer, but it is usually wrong. So what we are looking here uh, at is, is a very complex picture, both from the point of the microRNA and the target. So how do you approach that? Well, the first thing is to go to the computer and look for the tightness of interaction between the microRNA and the target. And we can do that to the normal allele and to the minor allele, the rare one. And we don't see much of a difference. We can do that for CDC42 and for ACHE. We can do it for 608 or for 132. doesn't give us any clue. So it's nice to have a theory, but we need practice. Uh, so what's it, what do you mean? So the numbers are the same. 25 the numbers 21. are in the same range. Okay? They do not sh talk about dramatic difference. That's what I mean. So now we do the same.
same kind of test we did before. That is, we create cells that will carry the major or the minor allele of human origin, because this is a non-mouse, and we check what would 608 do. And it blocks the major allele, but it doesn't block the minor allele. So you could say, fine, so this mutation kills the interaction. The, the problem is that I grew up in, in an environment of nucleic acid biochemistry. One nucleoside doesn't kill an interaction. It can make it weaker, but it shouldn't be an all or none effect. So I said, we need a better assay. We need something where we can find dissociation constants. And we moved on to uh, the SPR. And what we do here is we tie one oligonucleotide that mimics the microRNA to a gold leaf. We flow the other one that mimics the target over it, and we measure the magnetic resonance of the gold leaf. And that gives us a dissociation constant. So we look at 608, and we find now that it binds the major allele with a binding constant of three nanomolar, like a monoclonal antibody. This is very tight binding. The minor allele shows 15-fold weaker binding, which is still significant. It's not an all or none. We now have a range. CDC 42, that should be the competitor, is somewhere in between. It's 16 nanomolar. And 132 binds <coughs> the same just like uh, CDC. <coughs> if that is the case, then what can we say about what happens to carriers of one or another allele? And what we can say is that there is a pendulum here. If you have a mutation that interferes with suppressing acetylcholine esterase, you'll get too much acetylcholine esterase. But you'll also get a lot of free microRNA molecules that cannot interact now with their native target. So they would go to another target, and they will over-suppress the anxiolytic protein. So we'll have a dual reaction. We'll have too much anxiety because of excess acetylcholine esterase, and we should have even more anxiety because we lose the bringing of GABAergic receptors to the sinus. So that, again, needs to be proven. This is a theory. And again, it's a gene that does not exist in a mouse. So what we do is take cells with one or another allele, and we infect them with increasing amount of the microRNA. And then we check what happens to the two targets. And you see here that the patterns are inverse. The major allele suppresses acetylcholine is much better than CDC42. The minor allele does the opposite. So at the level of the cell, this is fine. What happens in the brain? So we got brain samples from the Netherlands Brain Bank. We genotyped them. We took three brains of carriers of the major allele, homozygous carriers, and three brains of carriers of the minor allele. And we checked the microRNA, it's the same level. We checked the acetylcholine SS, it's 60% higher, which is very much too much. And butyryl choline SS is not modified, so this is a selective change that is inherited. So people with this minor allele, they shouldn't be really sick, but they have a genetically inherited change. They have too much acetylcholine SS. What does that mean about the other targets? So again, we look at the possibility that the change in acetylcholine esterase and the modified interaction with this microRNA would change the levels of CDC42. And as we were doing this, another inflammation-related target was discovered for this microRNA, interleukin-6. And Geula again ran a lot of blots from the brain of those people, and what she finds is that CDC42 is reduced, and interleukin-6 is reduced in the brain of these carriers. Now, this gave us another advantage. True, the microRNA doesn't exist in mice, 
but CDC 42 does exist in mice. So we now have a chain of events and we could, in principle, try to see if changes in CDC 42 induce anxiety. So what Geula did next was to take an inhibitor of CDC 42, which was studied by others for other purposes, inject it into the brain and calibrate the level so that she will get the same level of reduction as we see in the human patients. And then she checked what the mice do. And these mice run at the periphery of the cage. They show a real preference to be out and not inside where it's more anxious. We could show that in an elevated plasmate they show massive anxiety. So again, now we are back in business. We could look in the mouth for the chain of events of that microRNA that exists only in humans. But that's not enough. I mean, Otto Lowy, who discovered the acetylcholine, would probably be quite surprised to say that acetylcholine, which he discovered for neuromuscular functioning, works with anxiety and that microRNAs might silence that. But Seneca would tell you that all humans are slaves to fear, so why not test that in human beings? And that moved us to a study that we've done 10 years ago. When I was lecturing in the United States on acetylcholine estrogen stress, what else? And I was approached by representatives of an American consortium that got together 500 volunteers and their goal in life is to find the damages involved with routine exercise. The most American goal I've ever heard about. And they have these people, or they had these people, who are 35 years old, all routine exercise, all normal BMI. They had DNA, they had serum, they put each of them with a psychologist. They had anxiety questionnaires, they had hormone levels in the blood. And they published articles in the Midwest <coughs> American Sports Journal. When they heard me, they said, would you like to join us? So I did. So I sent a PhD student in the lab, a last class. She's now a faculty member in Tel Aviv University. She went to Louisiana. She didn't like it there, but she came back <coughs> with the 500 samples, DNA, serum, and a lot of computer data. And we collaborated with a Yankee Rito from statistics, and we showed that those people who had more acetylcholine esterase in their serum than predicted for their age, gender, ethnic origin, and BMI were indeed suffering from more anxiety. So that study had two caveats in it, and two were of sort of political nature. The first problem was that women showed up as much more anxious than men. And I already had a confrontation in one of the Mili Safra meetings in Paris where a woman jumped up, literally, in the audience, and she said, we live in an era where women should take their place in society and do important things. How are you saying that we are more anxious? And I said, I couldn't agree with you more, or I wouldn't be here lecturing, but we also need to acknowledge the facts. That was the easy problem. The bad problem was that there were black Americans and Caucasians. And the black Americans came up with extremely higher anxiety. To the extent that, just to hide this, we only wrote in the text of that PNAS paper that the statistical significance of the difference is 10 to the minus 17. And none of the reviewers touched this hot potato. And we didn't, practically, we didn't understand why that was the case. Now we genotyped it. So again, <coughs> Shanish and Ha looked at the data after genotyping, and uh, African Americans had 34.5% of carriers of the minor relief, whereas Caucasians had 4.5%. So it's a dramatic difference. They show higher level of inflammation, higher level of a trait but not state anxiety, so inherited but not anxiety at the time of the test. And we looked at the other uh, uh, pieces of information we had and we found that carriers of the minor allele show much lower levels of cortisol 
than the others, and as low as those defined for post-traumatic stress patients. They also show higher systolic and diastolic blood pressure. So these are healthy young volunteers, but if I was the family clinician, I would say, watch it. You inherited some genes that may cause problems. So what is the theory here? What we are thinking is that cholinergic signals and anxiety are controlling inflammation. Inflammation feeds on anxiety. And this is a vicious cycle that can be controlled by microRNAs. And I need to repeat that this is just one microRNA. There would be many, but we somehow stumbled on one that is high up in the hierarchy. And it controls acetylcholinesterase and other inflammation, anxiety, and blood uh, 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 pressure regulator. And when we have one arm of this formulation disrupted, then we get much more inflammation and anxiety <coughs> and blood pressure. Now, in, in anxiety and inflammation are highly abundant. I can't tell you if Woody Allen carries this mutation. I can tell you that in Israel we find 17%. So if any of you wonder, we are somewhere in between Africa and a Caucasian country. <coughs> so again, a quotation, it's not new, Schopenhauer said many years ago, that uh, uh, faith gives us the hand and we need to play the cards as best we can. Now which diseases could be relevant to this? Again, Shani's previous paper dealt with stroke patients. And what we found there is that stroke patients differ in the acetylcholinesterase levels. So now what she did was to take these, again, 500 patients and genotype them. Immediately after stroke, patients show impaired cognition, impaired executive function, and impaired memory, which is reasonable. Two years after, if they do not carry the minor allele, they recover in all three parameters. But if they do, they do not recover. And we now think that this could be an indication to give them blockers of cholinesterase, which are approved medications, but no one thought about analyzing for patients in this respect. So when we talk about <coughs> personalized medicine, this is uh, one example. Okay, what we do now is we ask the new question, that is, suppose we go to the other genes that control cholinergic signals, like cholinocetic transferase, a vesicular transporter, would they share microRNAs? And apparently they do. So Bettina Nadot in the lab uh, finds a lot of microRNAs that theoretically right now target more than one gene in this case and five of those are finding specific. And they relate, you won't be surprised, to here to inflammation, brain damage, and cardiac damage. So what about in a evolution? We are working, Shachar Barbash is working, I'm supposed to read what he's done recently on a manuscript that talks about the evolutionary contribution of microRNAs to brain development. And the model we came up with says that young microRNAs will be very unstable, will have a lot of targets, mainly in the brain, that's by analyzing a lot of them. Then they become transient phase, and they lose some of those targets that would make them incompatible with survival, so that some microRNA evolution might kill the carrier. And finally, we get a stable microRNA with very few targets. So what happens when you lose microRNA regulation? And how do you find that out? So what Shachar is doing in that aspect is to try to look at the terminal end of those coding sequences in the Alzheimer's brain, because that is the end that interacts with microRNA. And he does that by deep sequencing and by searching for <coughs> modified sequences in the brain of healthy volunteers, Alzheimer's patients, and the third group, which is the most interesting in my eyes, and these are people who carry 
amyloid plaques in the brain that manage to fight that. They don't show a cognitive decline. So I would think that it's presumptuous to say we will find a drug to alter this disease because treatment always starts too late. But the fact that there are people who can fight the pathology makes sense because then we can find genes that are different in their brain. And what uh, Shahar finds is about 140 gene groups that are indeed different in the brain of these genes. Last but not least, microRNAs are probable. So you can synthesize a DNA that would block their function. We have a DNA drug in a clinical trials today in inflammatory bowel disease in a Jerusalem startup. If they find $20 million more, they may complete with their study. And that's about it. So there's a lot of things to do when you run such a study, primarily to the patients, the volunteers, not only those of blood samples and psychological questionnaires, but the heroes that volunteer their brain post-mortem for the benefit of research. There's a lot of things to say to our collaborators, because these are very collaborative studies. You can't do it without the clinicians to take care of the patients. There's a lot of thanks to the foundations that support us. And what I tried to say today is that in the group, which is the major power that makes this study, we find single nucleotide polymorphisms and microRNA that apparently contribute to the control of anxiety, hypertension, and inflammation, and that polyadenylation choices may change the microRNA interaction in the risk of Alzheimer's disease. This could have an, an evolutionary implication. I would like to thank you for sitting through this. Explain this evolution thing that, uh, like, uh, I will ask you the same. Like, yes. evolution is so many years, etc. You mentioned that could the microRNA could yeah. be modified at so the level of the life uh, lifespan of an individual. No, no, no. I didn't say lifespan okay. of an individual. Although I cannot exclude that, I said since the speciation of the hominid tribe which is very short time in evolutionary term, apparently there were new microRNAs that developed. And no, those... What is the Chahal describes that you go from yes, young to... Yes, this talks about many millions of years, not about the lifespan oh. of an individual. Although other people find now that in the human brain there are mutations that happen within the brain of a live individual and that would probably change the functioning of that brain. We don't know yet how to even approach that. So that's why I'm saying I can't exclude that. But what we do read in the literature and our findings support, and, and uh, we went actually to Sakib Schiffman to have a real genetic look into that. And what we find is that the newly evolved microRNAs that are unique to primates or unique to humans have a different level of expression in the brain. They are those that are expressed in the brain. They have many more targets in the brain than in other tissues. So I personally believe that microRNAs are part of what made us what we are. This is a, a very clever change. I keep saying that this, this gene family is so clever that if it didn't exist, someone should invent it because it controls things rather than making things. So it's much more powerful. So, uh, uh, the, the big picture, okay. before the microRNA, genes were also controlled, primarily by other genes. Yes, transcription factors, for example. This right. is usually the comparison. You can have genes that control expression, but that would be a slow process. You could have genes that block expression, and that would be a more rapid and much less, less energy consuming, because these are tiny elements. Okay, that's the, the novelty, that's the innovation in this field. 
And that's why it is most important <coughs> in the brain. You keep thinking, what happens in a synapse? Can a gene get there and be transcribed? I don't know, but it can be blocked there. So a lot of uh, molecular neuroscientists are working now on microRNA regulation at the level of the synapse. So, the, so microRNA primarily function is blocking. Yes. There are always inhibitory. The, well, you could say there is inhibition that blocks. Uh, there could be inhibition of a blocker mm -hmm. that would activate. Right, but they, but they no, are they, they could they inhibit another block. Definitely. But they could act on another microRNA. They, oh, oh. not that I know of, they act on the protein coding genes. But again, I wouldn't exclude that either. Every year there is <coughs> new surprises. This is what is so much fun about. Well, any, any idea what's special about 22 nucleotides? You say you found one that's 25 or 26. Yeah, well, that's, that's very unusual. That's very unusual. That's why we went into all that work to prove that it's a real microRNA. But part of the researchers believe that microRNAs, when they are born, they may be more variable in length, and then they are carved into the final stable length of 22, which gives you a stable loop and a stem which would enable hybridization. Again, you this is a post-factum explanation. So you think you can't have small RNAs that are other lengths that will do the job of inhibiting uh -huh. mRNAs? Most of the microRNAs that are known are 22, and uh, I was in a conference last week in Austria, where, and I met someone who decided to sequence non-coding RNAs and 20 years ago, which was really insightful, and he cut 50 nucleotides because he thought that anything functional should be at least 50 nucleotides long. So he walks around and says, I invented this field although I cut the wrong, wrong size. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for a beautiful and important talk. But uh, I think uh, the, what relates to him, for instance, in the Bible, gold is called Yerakarat which means that the so gold uh, the mutation of a uh, thin color distinction between red and, and uh, green is a recent uh, mutation that wasn't present to many people in the <coughs> Bible. Okay. So they saw gold as your crack. Could very well be, but if we are quoting the Bible, let me say that the Bible <laughs> talks about stress in terms of intestinal discomfort. And <laughs> <laughs> so exactly. That's what I want. That's what I want to fi uh, find out. If you know, do androgens affect inflammation in a similar way the intestinal? How how is the connection between intestinal and brain inflammation and androgens and uh, brain inflammation? It's too much to for one lifetime. <laughs> okay, this is a right. huge topic. What about intestinal we, connection? We, we, we worked on the connection between intestinal inflammation and stress in the brain. And if you send me an email, I'll send you the article. Good. Uh, there is an association and it's a setting calling media.